All right, it is noon Eastern time. So why don't we get started so we can get everybody on with the rest of the day or into a long weekend. Hello and welcome to our webinar after the pandemic. This event is being sponsored by the new Resilience Media Program at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. That's a part of Andy Revkin's initiative on communication and sustainability. We've had help in preparing the program from the economics for the Anthropocene program at the Gund Institute of the University of Vermont. This program is being streamed live on their Facebook page. So if you only want to watch video and listen there, you can do that as well. I'm Dale Willman. I run the Resilience Media Program at the Earth Institute. I've spent more than 30 years as a journalist working both locally and at several networks, including CNN, CBS, and 12 years at NPR. And I continue to fill in from time to time there as a newscaster. Uh, this is a new position for me at Columbia. For the past three years, I designed and ran a Resilience Science Journalism Fellowship at the Graduate School, uh, uh, School of Journalism at CUNY. I'm glad to see a lot of the fellows are online with us. That program will now make up the foundation of the Resilience Media Program at Columbia. A couple of quick operational issues before I introduce our speakers. First, you may notice that your mics are all muted because of the number of folks who are joining us today. We're not taking questions through Zoom. We've also disabled comments on Zoom, and that's because we're going to try another way of taking questions and comments. So I needed to get a piece of paper and write this down. We have plenty of time at the end of the discussion to respond to questions. So if you think you may want to ask a question during the session, please open a web browser right now and you're gonna to head to the site onlinequestions.org. That's onlinequestions.org. And uh, I'll need you to write a, a number down so you have this. It's the following code. It's 327-2020. Some of you got the code earlier and that's no longer accurate. Um, the host of that one managed to lose his password. Uh, so the new one is 3-27-2020. That goes in the event number. Open up the box and uh, you'll be able to type in questions there. The uh, key of this is that you can like questions. You don't have to type something, but if you see a question that you want to hear answered, you like it. And because we'll probably have a lot of questions, those questions will rise to the top. The ones who are most liked will be the first ones. So that's a good way of getting your question or one that you want to hear answered to rise to the top. Um, there's a downside to all this technology, as you know, as we're all learning how to work better from our house. You probably have seen that video of the young girl in the uh, video chat who took her phone to the bathroom with her and didn't realize the video was still on. Uh, this applies as well to writing your questions. They can be seen by everyone, so no personal information, no personal comments. Be very careful about what you put in there, just your question only. One final note, this event was conceived to help journalists wanting to cover this issue, so I'd like to give them priority on questions. This is an honor system thing, but if you're a journalist, put journalist in your question and we'll try to get those first. And please, no cheating. So let's get to our guests. A uh, quick introduction of uh, who will be speaking today. Juliet Shore, first of all, she's a professor of sociology at Boston College. She writes and lectures on the connections between consumerism, work life, and environmental sustainability. Before arriving at Boston College, she taught for 17 years in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. She is best, a best-selling a best author. Her most recent book is called Sustainable Lifestyles and the Quest for Plenitude, published by Yale University Press. Nate Hagens came to academia the way, well, Nate, almost no one does. He used to work on Wall Street. About 20 years ago, he began exploring the concepts of energy use and limits to growth and eventually shifted to a life in academia. Nate's become a well-known speaker on the major issues facing humanity. He also teaches a well-attended system synthesis honors seminar at the University of Minnesota called Reality 101, a survey of the human predicament. Nate's appeared on numerous network television programs, and he has a book coming out titled Reality Blind. But our first speaker is John Erickson. John's been one of my guides as I've walked through the world of resilience thinking. He does the introductory portion of my fellowship programs and will do something similar for us today. John's the David Blittersdorf Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at the University of Vermont. He's a world leader in the field of ecological economics and has also done international research on infectious disease modeling. He's also an Emmy Award-winning producer of documentaries, including one about Bernie Sanders called Waking the Sleeping Giant. 
John's also done economic modeling for the current Sanders campaign of the employment impacts of Bernie's Green New Deal. So he has clearly a lot of experience in what we're going to be talking about here. And if that were not enough, he has a new book coming out with our friends at Chelsea Green Publishing entitled Oikos, A New Economic Story. And he's graciously allowing us to use his Facebook page to stream today's event. John, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you could unmute you. your mic. Uh, you and I spent the past three years introducing journalists from around the world to resilience thinking. What is resilience and how does it fit into that current discussion that uh, we're having around the pandemic today? Yeah, thank, thanks for having me, Dale, and thanks for organizing this. Um, resilience, you know, in the simplest terms, is the ability to bounce back. So I, I can't think of a more important concept in this time of the pandemic. You know, when you're knocked down, can you return to normal? Um, resilience has been, of course, applied to people, families, communities, parts of economies and societies, like currently our health sector, and even whole economies. Um, you know, really the flip side of resilience is vulnerability, um, which is the questions we should all be asking about this current pandemic. You know, where are our systems most vulnerable and how does this pandemic reveal those vulnerabilities? Um, so that's, that's resilience. Um, this question of bouncing back to normal is an important one. You know, like normal might not be a system that we all we're benefiting from. Normal might be a system that concentrates the benefits to the few, but distributes the cost to the many. Um, so ultimately, I think this conversation is, is about, you know, returning to what system and how and for whom. Well, and so the, the, what we've seen in this pandemic is the uh, collapse of a lot of economic systems. Talk about that briefly, the, the extended supply chains, just-in-time manufacturing, all these things that that are efficient for a particular output, but not necessarily for an economy. So what have we seen from our economy right now through this pandemic that has made it so brittle to collapse so drastically and so quickly as it has? Yeah, um, you know, often when we think about resilience, um, and, and particularly in the context of the current pandemic, uh, the resilience of the global economy, it's important to assess um, the interaction of what, what what are often called fast and slow variables, um, and this is I think this is really important for journalists um, because it's the fast variables, right, that get the most attention. Those are the things that change quickly and are easily noticed and measures. Um, you know, for example, we just heard that unemployment numbers have surged um, and that unemployment claims just hit an all-time high this past week of 3.3 million people. Um, but when we think about resilience as the kind of erosion, the slow erosion of those variables that kind of maintain the system. Um, it's the gradual deterioration of conditions, uh, the gradual deterioration of social conditions, like all the forms of safety nets and common pool resources uh, and, and, and care for it's the erosion of cultural norms, of cooperation, of trust, of participation and governance. And, uh, you know, and it's the kind of death by a thousand, of, thousand cuts of our shared uh, environment, the degradation of our water, our soil, our forests, our air, our oceans, our climate that makes all life possible, not just humans. So that's, that's the kind of context of resilience right now. So, I mean, we, 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 we've seen in this economy a lot of things go so drastically, and you've outlined those, social, cultural, is there, so as we saw in 2008, the effort was to quickly get back to where we were before. It was economic stimulation to, uh, stimulus packages to uh, save, you know, businesses too big to fail. It was efforts to put money quickly into the economy so people would, would spend and businesses could return to normal. Uh, the reason for doing this, this webinar is the idea of having a conversation now about whether that normal we return to, which has shown again to be so incredibly brittle that it could collapse so quickly. I, I think one of the things that people are anxious about, it's not just the health issues of this pandemic, but the fact that the economy has tanked so fast. Is there a, uh, a newer vision? Is there a a radically different economic model? Are there things we can do to put in place now to create a different economic model that would be more sustainable, which is in part, I think, part of the discussion in your new book? Yeah, um, 
yeah, I mean, sticking with the theme of resilience, uh, a new economic story would prioritize different things, right? It would prioritize, for example, redundancy in our systems instead of this myopic, nearly sole focus on efficiency that has really led to the current crisis in our healthcare system. Um, a new economic story will really be stories with an S, right? So that we cherish and celebrate diversity, human, cultural, biological, instead of this this ongoing steady march towards this master narrative of, of, of corporate capitalism. Um, a new story would, would elevate fairness and justice above greed and a winner take, take all society. And um, you know, from my perspective as an ecological economist, perhaps what's most needed and least discussed is a story about right sizing the economy with a focus on dialing back the scale of the economic system that is to within its ecological limits. Um, so, you know, we, I've spent a, a, my career on questioning the holy grail of economic growth. That's been a hallmark of ecological economics for decades. And, you know, in thinking about this uh, talk today, I was reminded of, of Kenneth Boulding's quote, um, who was one of the early visionaries of ecological economics, who wrote an essay back in 1966 on the economics of the coming spaceship Earth. And uh, Professor Boulding said, and here's, here's his quote, anyone who thinks that endless growth in a limited world is possible is either a madman or an economist. So I think it's really important to reflect on that right now. All right, so let's be clear about this. The, the idea of this conversation is to talk about the idea of creating and envisioning a new model and how we get there. So you've talked about some of the broad themes. Uh, let's get more specific. What does that actually mean? Uh, when people hear this, they're gonna think socialism. They're gonna think all these things that have been bandied about. Uh, how do we allay that? And how do we begin laying out the bones of what this might look like and, and, and how we would progress forward? We've already got a $2 trillion, uh, uh, more than $2 trillion package out there that's bringing things back to some extent to the old way, what would a new way look like? What, what does that pathway, what, how, how do we start creating that? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that Julie Shore is with us because she's, she's given a lot of thought to alternative ways of thinking about the economy um, as, as we have in ecological economics. Um, you know, this new story that elevates justice and fairness and, and this concern with scale is gonna be about a, a smaller, more nimble economy um, moving towards uh, relocalization strategies, moving towards, you know, building resilience to regional bio-based bio economies, um, moving towards strategies of ecological restoration, uh, strategies of new ownership models, right, where we don't all work for these um, systems that are largely undemocratic called businesses or corporations. Um, new strategies where we have the bent knees so that we take the shocks that aren't so, so reliant on these global supply chains. I and mean, I think that's one of the big, big lessons learned from this current pandemic uh, and this current economic crisis that we're moving into. Um, you know, last time around when I, when I was reflecting on the, the, the Great Recession, um, you know, that was more like a house of cards effect, right? Where we saw how vulnerable the system was to the greed of Wall Street, a highly leveraged housing market. This time around, the metaphor is maybe more like a tidal wave, right? Where the pandemic has levered entire, leveled entire sectors of the economy all at once. So, you know, we're not going to have the tools available that we had last time, like just flooding the market with money, lowering interest rates. Um, you know, the last recession that we've come out of, and, and we've created a kind of more, more vulnerable system with the Trump tax cuts and the growing student loan crisis and low interest money that has artificially boosted the stock market. So when I think about the new economy, it's at a much different scale. It's a much different story of, of restoration. Um, and ultimately it's one that we all benefit from. Can this current crisis, does, is it creating a, a condition where we could shift to this, this new vision? And we'll talk to Juliet more and more in depth about that specific vision, but have we gotten to the point where where it's you think it might be possible? Well, I hope so. I think that's that's part of this conversation. Um, you know, the the last crisis certainly shook the younger generation. Um, 
you know, we launched this economics for the Anth Anthropocene project off the heels of the last crisis on a mandate for change, right? Um, in our case, in, in academia, you know, we've been working on updating entirely outdated, disconnected, and at times dangerous disciplines like economics um, and reforming higher education, writing a new, new social contract to get back to the sort of, you know, education foundation of civilization. Um, I, I'm encouraged by the rising youth voice. And, and I think hopefully we can lean into that with this, with coming out of this new crisis that will be different from 10 years ago. Uh, the youth climate movement, the young people at the base of a new progressive movement in America. Um, I hate to say it for folks like you and me, Dale, but the, it's time for the young people to tell us old parts to uh, lead follower get out of the way all right so let's let's do some more broad brush here and we'll we'll get more specifics with with julie the the congress and the administration have <clears throat> rolled out this two trillion dollar economic stimulus uh what do you like what doesn't work for you what could be done better yeah so i, I i've appreciated the conversation even in the mainstream media about a, a kind of question of the stimulus for whom and towards what so I'm really encouraged that this is not an entirely trickle-down approach this time around with uh, you know, the corporate bailouts and the unconditional loans that really dominated the 2008-2009 stimulus. stimulus. Um, since you know, this isn't about stimulating the private sector to get back to work, right? because at least in the short term, people can go back to work, um, Congress has had to swallow their neoliberal faith and realize that the base of the economy is the underemployed, the underpaid, the overextended worker who lives paycheck to paycheck. So in the short term, I'm encouraged by, you know, strategies of extending unemployment benefits, providing checks to families, suspending debt payments so that people don't get their check and use it to pay credit card bills. Um, so the, the bigger question to me is, what does it look out, you know, a few months past that? What is the bridge to that new future look like to a more resilient economy that is less beholden to global global corporate interests and that's the conversation we're having so this is more of a stopgap just to get things going again and you think that we need more to uh, push us in a different direction it is yeah and, and you know nate might talk more about how leveraged the current economic model is and how much debt we have um and and um it's it's you know we can afford the two trillion no, no doubt about it but it, it's the question of you know, we spent a lot of money getting out of the last, last great recession. It's not like when the economy started growing, we started paying down the debt. We just kept piling it on, um, let the good times roll. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, um, and, and there's a lot of reasons that the, the growth model that's been built on cheap fossil fuels and, and near free money isn't working anymore and can't save us this time around. Um, so this is the question to have. What would relocalization look like? What would the the non-market economy look like um, would uh, really of our time and um, pivoting away from you know this kind of economic citizenship where we're supposed to just spend 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 to keep the economy going instead of saving and spending our time more on the things that matter so um, I know Julie's reflected on these kinds of themes out of the last recession and I hope we'll reflect again out of this current one so um, there's been a lot of strangeness that's come out of this. There's the, the attorney in California who basically said, uh, I forget what his tweet was, but I think he was basically writing off, you know, all the old folks. There's the politician in Texas who basically said the same kind of thing. Um, there, but, but there's been some interesting health effects from this mm. and climate effects. So uh, a reduction in factory output, a lot of other things have actually had a positive effect on uh, the world's environment um, and yeah. is saving lives because of people who are not going to be affected as much by the pollution that they're not seeing because of this reduced economic activity. Can you talk about that just briefly, what, that, uh, what that's looked like and what the benefits for the, for the environment have been? Sure, sure, yeah, um, early on because you know, China got the most attention in this, in this space, um, both because they were the early focal point of the pandemic, but also that they're the largest carbon polluter in the world. So we've seen, you know, in the past month or two, Chinese coal consumption is down, steel production is down, 
oil refining is down, air travel is down altogether. Estimates are that China's carbon emissions as, as one data point have dropped perhaps as, as, as at least 25% just in a month. Um, you know, that's, that's more than all the climate negotiations have, have ever achieved. Um, so, and we're see seeing similar uh, reports of clean air in cities around the world, including New York. Uh, so, you know, maybe, just maybe, this will help us all stop and think about the slow erosion of all the things that we take for granted, right? Air, water, climate. You know, maybe this will reset our expectations of what's possible and, and we'll readjust our goals and priorities for a, a post-pandemic pandemic economy. Um, you know, you and I have talked about this, Dale, with our journalist trainings. You know, we're all susceptible to what's been called change blindness, right? Where we, we don't even notice or we're even manipulated to look away from the slow erosion of our social and ecological systems. Um, so if we're searching for a silver lining, maybe it's about a mass kind of realization that there is a different way. All right, so one, one other quick question. Uh, there, I, we've sort of done a, a, a run through of some of the problems we're seeing, some of the issues and, and kind of a broad brush view of where we might be able to head to. But, but how do you get there when you've got 3.3 million people unemployed in a week, you've got uh, uh, people uh, without health care, you've got all these problems that have been uh, so extremely exacerbated by yep. what's happening right now with the pandemic. And they're just saying, holy shit, I want to be back to normal. Sure. Uh, I don't even want to think of a, of a new path of a different way uh, when I can't heal right now. So, I mean, what, what's, what's the argument to say, hey, okay, let's, let's step back for a second and let's sort of assess while you're trying to find toilet paper for your kids. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, like we, we've discussed, um, there are bridging strategies, there are emergency strategies, there are strategies that kind of bring back some normalcy of the system that we're used to. And then there is the opportunity to be thinking about, um, you know, you mentioned in the opening that I've done some work on the Green New Deal to be thinking about stimulus kind of package in a different way, right? To be stimulating the economy in ways where we're just not, um, you know, hoping for consumerism to save us, but a, a, an actual break from the past. Um, you know, as with the old New Deal, it's essentially a stimulus plan, uh, the Sanders plan and other plans that have considered this idea of a Green New Deal, but with purpose and in direction with a, with a critical focus on the most vulnerable people and communities in America. And I, I, I can't think of a more important narrative right now than what's been proposed in the Green New Deal. Um, you know, it's, it's about an investment in the transformation of the economy. That's kind of how we have to be thinking. Um, not just transforming the energy sector, but build resilience into our communities that are already prone to fire, floods, hurricanes. I mean, a lot of communities have been in a disaster mode for some time now, uh, and the pandemic is just the latest. Um, in, in investing in our, our food, water, and waste management systems, um, investing in a new workforce for the new economy. So, you know, there's no reason that we can't um, move towards strategies that move our economy in a dramatically different direction that at the end of the day might be less vulnerable for the next pandemic and actually could do something about the large, larger looming crisis of climate change. All right, I hear what you're saying. I'm not totally convinced yet, so I think we need to drill down a bit more. But okay. uh, we are talking to journalists and, and I've asked yeah. each of you to come up with a, a story idea or two because I want some actionable stuff that people can walk away from this. So if you have one now, and we'll try and do a few more after this, just before we take questions. So sure. what's, what's one big story that you think that journalists should be uh, thinking about covering on this? Yeah, it's hard to boil it down to one. There are so many, but I'll try. Um, we'll, we'll come back to more, though, to more at the end. Yeah, yeah. So let, let, let's maybe go back to where we started about resilience, uh, which is how you and I first started working together. The problem is... I don't want to sound too academic about this, but the problem is that we have tons and tons and tons of reactive stories about the fast variables, right? The changes that are happening and measurable and right, right before our eyes. 
we don't have enough of the what you might call proactive stories about the slow variables. So, you know, just to lean into the pandemic story, the pandemic comes as no surprise to folks who have been working in the field of environmental public health, for example, where we've been connecting the dots for a long time between the deterioration of ecosystems and the emergence of both old and new infectious disease. But no one's telling those stories of that slow deterioration of the conditions. They're all reacting to the kind of story of the moment. Um, there are hundreds and thousands of stories of people building a new economy, building a more inclusive, ecological, resilient economy. These are stories of ecological restoration, as we talked about, cooperative ownership, relocalization, um, building community networks, and ultimate long-term planning. Like planning, the story about planning, I, I hear you, it's like a yawner, but ultimately we need the P word, we need to plan, and those are some of the stories that need to be told. I think one of the, one of the most significant things that we try to get the journalists from the fellowship to take away from them is to be uh, reflective, reflective yeah. practitioners, to sit back and think about how those stories fit in. And it's, it's hard with the diminished newsrooms and the increasing pressures for content to sit back and think more uh, directly about what it is you're doing. But I think I, that's what I hear you saying here is that, that to step back and look at these connections rather than just what's the next thing coming in over the transom. Yeah, and if, if you, I'll just maybe conclude, I know you wanna to get to Julie, is that the challenge is like, stop telling the stories of like the saviors from above, right? The billionaire who woke up and decided to direct their resources towards, you know, helping society, but shaped around their own priorities, right? We need to still tell the stories of all of us that are working to create a more resilient, more fair economy. Okay, on that note, I want to move over to uh, Juliet. And I will say, by the way, that we will have uh, at the end time for questions. So start submitting your questions, if you will. Um, and we will also have information at the end about a resource page that we're going to put up and we'll try and put some story ideas there too. So we'll have links to some articles, some videos, some other uh, information of interest to journalists, and we'll try to include some uh, and have an ongoing list perhaps of story ideas that we see that you might want to cover in this realm. But John, thank you for that. Yeah, Dale, we've that. had a lot of new people join us. You might want to mention that online questions. Oh, thank you. That's right. I meant to. Uh, so we're doing questions online. So those who have joined uh, uh, late, uh, go to onlinequestions.org, the website onlinequestions.org, and you will need a code. It is 327-2020. Put that in the event number and click, I think it's open, and that'll take you to the page. You'll type your questions in there. You can also like questions if you don't want to type one, but you see when you like, click on that. And those will rise to the top. And those are the ones that we'll start looking at when we, when we go to questions in just a little bit. All right, Julie from uh, Boston College. This is kind of in your wheelhouse, I think. One immediate pathway for the economy might be anchored in localization strategies and ways to get by without relying on the global supply chain. And your research has been in the realm of sharing, uh, a sharing economy and shifting patterns. Could we see a great reliance on a sharing economy now and uh, perhaps in a post-pandemic economy? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, thanks, Dale, and thanks, John, for your, um, uh, for your thoughts. Um, and just want to say it's great to be here. I see some old friends um, in, the, uh, in the webinar, so hi to all of you. Um, I started studying the sharing economy 10 years ago because it was one of the things that came out of the financial collapse and the Great Recession. And um, I think the answer to your question about its potential for taking us in a new direction is that it really depends what kind of sharing we're talking about and whether we mean uh, sort of localized uh, community sharing initiatives or what's going on with the big platforms, which have also been termed a sharing economy, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and so forth. So community Community sharing uh, initiatives do tend to be resilient, although like anything, they can be wiped out by viral events such as the one we're, we're uh, experiencing. 
and sharing economies generally refer to local services. Those, so those tend to be a bit more resilient than the global supply chains we've talked about. Um, and there are other aspects of the sharing economy that are particularly resilient. Um, so for example, if we think about something like cooperative ownership, which is certainly a sharing idea, cooperatively owned firms, and here I'm talking about worker, worker cooperatives, but I think you know, probably true of consumer co-ops also, they tend to do what we call labor hoard uh, during downturns. So they keep people on um, the payroll. That's been a big conversation, obviously, in the country in the last couple of weeks. They keep people on in periods of reduced demand more than conventional firms do. But I should also say this is also a characteristic of economies. So if we look at the response to the collapse, the financial collapse 10 years ago, European economies, particularly Western European economies, did a lot more labor hoarding than in the United States, uh, where firms laid off many more people. And that's a function of kind of the way our market has been operating. Um, Again, just to jump in real quick to be clear on this. So labor hoarding is, is a good thing. It's keeping people on payrolls. So it allows a company to keep skilled labor for when they do come back. So we think of hoarding as a negative, but in this case, you're saying labor hoarding is a good thing to keep people, money in people's pockets, healthcare, whatever it might be. Yes. In this, okay. in this kind of a context, obviously, one of the questions about co worker co-ops that economists have had is, do they do too much labor hoarding all the time? In, in which case they become less efficient and less productive per worker because they, they never want to lay people off. Actually, their productivity per worker looks about the same as conventionally owned firms. So they, they just, they, they, they act differently in the downturns, which is, yes, that's a good thing now, particularly, and, and in general. So the, the sort of corporate sharing economy, the part of the sharing economy that got so much press, uh, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, et cetera, I would say is less resilient than conventional firms. And that's because the key part of their business model was shifting risk onto their workers, uh, largely through the classification of workers as independent contractors rather than employees. Um, when, when firms hire employees, they have to bear various kinds of risks around unemployment insurance, uh, injury, and, and uh, shortfalls, more, more on shortfalls in demand. The, the, these platforms or gig labor firms or also called on-demand labor firms shifted all of that onto workers. And that creates a whole set of problems that you know, many of us have written about. Um, there's been and a lot we're, of we're, 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 we're seeing that. Sorry, we're seeing that right now because the, the unemployment numbers, the 3.3 million last week, is actually considered quite low because that's only those who qualify for unemployment, right? The, the number is actually higher because of these, these yeah. gig workers and other people who don't have access to unemployment. Yes, although the, ex the size of the gig labor force has been vastly, vastly over uh, played in the media, it, you know, whatever. Uh, not just in the media, but in people's imaginations and so forth. It, it, it's still a pretty small fraction of the labor force, you know, one to two percent. But yes, and, uh, you know, the good thing about the Senate stimulus bill is it has made all these folks eligible for unemployment. That's all great. Um, I, I want to just say one thing, and this, I think, echoes some of what John has said, but the current moment requires that we really pivot dramatically in how we think about the economy. And in sort of traditionally key issues that have been, you know, front and center for the economy since the 1980s, I would say, are things like incentives, the market, asset valuations, etc. A good number of them are those fast variables that John mentioned. But, and, and that's kind of very consistent with the neoliberal turn. But in fact, now we really need to think about the economy in a very different way because we're facing a situation where what's really key is to make economic decisions based on what we need to do, not on what is most profitable. Remember, 
we are shutting down the economy right now. This is a, a, a really, you know, a, a kind of, a, a kind of um, moment that, that is much more akin to war. Although in war, of course, we ramped up the economy, but we dramatically shifted what we were doing. And the more we are stuck in kind of recession-based conversation, like, oh, somehow we're in a recession. This is not a recession. This is not being caused by some internal problem in the economy. This is a shutdown. And when you have a shutdown, you've got to figure out what do we need to keep going and what do we need to stop doing? And so the whole discourse really needs to transform. And you know, some of this is really obvious. We need to focus on um, medical equipment, food, digital infrastructure, childcare. Those are the things we really need to focus on on the economic side. We need to suppress unnecessary consumption. We need to ramp these things up. Planning, as John mentioned, really key. But I'll make one more point because I know I'm going on longer than you want me to. Um, about economic thinking and how the current moment requires a different kind of economic thinking. Conventional economic thinking is, is really idealist in the sense that it sort of thinks of the economy in ideal terms and market behavior and so forth and kind of the material realities of production and eating and sleeping, uh, yeah, eating and care and shelter and all that are really kind of absent in the way economists think because the post-war economic model, the dominant model, took production for granted. And it's really all just about the distribution. That's what that general equilibrium model was. We've got to get back to, and this is classical economic thinking, not neoclassical. We got to get back to materiality because it's materiality that's going to get us through the next phase. So we got to be thinking about food and medical equipment Etc. and the digital infrastructure, which has a material basis. All right, so you've written about uh, your book, The Overworked American, The Overspent American. Uh, leverage is a big issue here, isn't it? And, and I've read, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, that this time around, as the economy collapses, uh, we're, as, as a society and as individuals, we're more highly leveraged than we were in 2008. Is that accurate? Um, I would doubt it. Okay. I would doubt it. I haven't what, seen that. But what role does, does this, um, this overspent America, what role does this, this play in, in a recovery and being able to come back? Okay. So one thing I should just say about the overspent American, which is a book I, I wrote in the 1990s, it's not about debt. It has one paragraph on debt. I know it sounds like overspending is about debt. It's really more about the social dynamics of, of, of sort of ratcheting, ever ratcheting up uh, uh, material output. But leave the, uh, 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 leaving that aside, debt, of course, was really important in the, in the crash, and it's still important. So I think to answer your question, let's go to the what's called the stimulus bill. I don't think we should even be using that term. I think that the, the, the words we use now um, are really key to how we reframe. If we're, if we're talking about re using this moment as a reframing moment for economic discourse, it's a maintenance bill. It's not about what happens when we get recovery. It is just about keeping people afloat. And, and there is, you know, bailout conversation and so forth, but it really think about it in this, this way. It's about sort of keeping people afloat in this period where the economy has been shut down. And I just want to keep emphasizing that this was a deliberate shutdown that we're going through for really important reasons. So the important moves, of course, are sending income, but also to your point about debt, the moratoria on evictions, foreclosures, car loan foreclosures, student debt, and so forth. And I think that, you know, we don't want to stimulate the economy right now. We just, that's the last thing we want to do. We want to shut it down, keep people in, keep them from trying to spend on things that are not where we should be, you know, focusing. Um, you mean from a health perspective, keep them inside, not, not. Yes. Ramp it and up also, again. you know, not be buying things that are not really what we need. We just need like to toilet focus paper? on the essentials right now. So, um, but in terms of coming out, coming out of the shutdown, I think that, 
we, we, we really need to ask the question, why is it that we have had so many people in debt for the last couple of decades, you know, leading up to the great, uh, the financial collapse and, and now? And the answer is that we have an economy which has made it impossible for large numbers of people to get access to basic things that they need without taking on large amounts of debt, whether it's housing, education, healthcare, and a, a, a vehicle. And the conversation we should be having is about coming out of here, how do we ensure that these basic needs are available to people without them having to take on debt? Because this current moment shows us the, the, the sort of irrationality and the, the, really the cruelty and the inhumanity of an economic system in which people must get access to these things in order to thrive, but yet they have to go into debt peonage to, to get them. Okay, I think we've got a, a, a pretty good critique from, from both of you about some of, the, some of the problems we're seeing and uh, some ideas on how to bring it back. I wanna to get to Nate here, but uh, if you would, if you have, uh, and I hear like three or four different stories in what, you, uh, what you've said so far, um, but um, uh, what, what one thing do you think journalists should be looking at? And I wanna throw out uh, one of the questions that's already come up that's been upvoted pretty high, which is any concrete and specific examples of towns, city, states, countries, doing it right, rethinking the economy that we can look to as examples and case studies that journalists can report on. So I'll throw it out. You may not have any examples, but that's something we want to want to consider. And maybe John will have something and Nate might when, when he speaks here in a second. But, but what, what one story right now, and we'll do more at the end here that you think that uh, journalists should be looking at. Yeah. So I did, I did send you a link about, um, which has the, the, uh, you know, sort of, examples of cities and towns doing uh, moratory on foreclosures and other kinds of uh, mutual aids and, and so right. forth. Um, I talked about planning, but there's another side to this. And my view of the economy that we want to move into is not to sort of go back to that earlier 20th century, highly centrally planned economy. We, we need planning now. We, there are aspects of our economy and society that certainly require planning. But one of the things that, that I, the, the sort of big theme of, uh, or one of the big things of my Plenitude book 10 years ago was the new possibilities for a much more distributed, uh, networked society, which has more of that localization and so forth. And you can, I think the story that that suggests for the current moment is the, the and we've had some of this already, but I think there's more to be written, the importance of self-organizing in the presence of state failure. So 3D printing, for example, which is you know, the big story on 3D printing of medical equipment now, and the possibilities of distributed localized manufacturing as a result of, of 3D printing, um, and, and the sort of self-help and mutual aid, and you know, some of those self-organizing things that are happening, because in my view, those are really key to the kind of, if we want to use the word resilience, it's not a term I, I am, uh, you know, that I work with a lot, um, but a resilient, pluralistic, diverse uh, economy is going to have, a, it, it's going to be a far more distributed and networked economy. So stories about that, I think are really important right now. Is there a specific story you can point to that you would say, this is something that would be great to cover right now? Well, the, all the 3D printing stuff of, of masks, ventilators, et cetera, fantastic uh, efforts going on on that. There's, I've seen a bit of it in the press, but I think it could be covered a lot more. Um, the, the exchange, the medical equipment exchanges, um, those are people self-organizing the self-help groups, mutual aid groups that people are doing. And those are in that, uh, some of those are in that link that I sent you. Great, and we'll put that up on uh, the page this weekend in the blog at, uh, at Andy's website. Julie, thank you. Uh, Nate, I'm gonna tee you up here, I think. Uh, even though we didn't talk about this, one thing that I think keeps coming, the thing that keeps coming through to me from this anyway is uh, there are different pathways. We've been talking about some of those and things we can do to, uh, 
to uh, move in a different direction. But it's it's that the human nature, you know, what is it about human nature? And and I mean, understandably, when your basic needs, when you're not being able to provide for your for your family, when there might be issues with food, you're afraid that you have no job, so you might be out in the street. It's hard to think of a new path forward. But what is it about human nature that makes us want to return to that normal? And is there a way to shift that for economists to address that in their efforts to create a new, more resilient economy? A simple uh, question for you. Yeah, hi, hi, Dale. Um, first of all, I apologize in advance. My girlfriend is working inside, so I'm outside with the dogs and Frank kind of owns me. So if he <laughs> gets on my lap, there's I have to just go with it. Um, so yeah, I don't think economic theory uh, really looks at who we are as biological organisms and the ancestral environment that we uh, uh, spent, you know, 290,000 of our 300,000 years uh, as, as humans, uh, we are incredibly self, uh, um, not only self-regarding, but other regarding. We care about our social uh, situation. And, you know, what is an economy to begin with? It, it, we take uh, uh, ideas and we combine natural resources with energy to make products that give us the feelings that our <laughs> successful uh, ancestors had in the past. Well, a lot of those feelings are incredibly resource intensive today. Um, and so I think a more sustainable economy, we would get those some, same feelings of dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin uh, and uh, collaboration and the warmth of, of community using less resources. Um, so right now, um, you know, we're, we're headed towards a bifurcated economy. Half of us uh, have some means and are comfortably working from our houses and the other half are worried where they're going to eat this weekend and I think that's going to accelerate in the next two or three weeks that three million we saw yesterday is nothing to what's coming so uh, the big two stories here the virus is not the biggest story the two big stories are the uh, fragility of our financial system and the inequalities of the bottom half of our society not being able to afford basic needs. So I well, don't know and, if that and, answers and, your question. Yeah, but. Nate, this, and this is something that I've, I've uh, talked with journalists about before. You know, we all have our worldview, and when you, you are uh, college educated and you live in a city and you have access to a lot of things, you forget that there's a big chunk of the, of the country that does not have access to high speed internet. So it's great that we all can join this and have this wonderful conversation on the internet. But I live in upstate New York, up in the North country, and there are a lot of people not far away from me who, if they're lucky, get DSL. And uh, in many instances, they can't even get that. They'll stream data off their phone if they can get a good signal. So that goes to your, your point of, of the, the half and half sort of uh, uh, nature of the country. Yeah, the, the virus didn't cause the problems. It just laid bare the problems that already existed. So what would a successful economic recovery look like to you and uh, recovery to what and for whom? Because clearly you're saying there's there's a whole half of the country for which even the, re the recovery, it doesn't seem like, would be enough. Well, I think as uh, Julie and John brought up, um, there's two timelines here. Right now we're in a national emergency. So she's right that it's, this isn't really a stimulus bill and it's too small. Right now we have to do two things. Republicans don't want to bail out people. We have to bail out people. Democrats don't want to bail out corporations. We have to bail out corporations. We have to keep the system afloat during this period. It's like we have a patient, which is our global economy connected to an ICU unit in the hospital, and we're trying to change their diet and their exercise routine at the same time. We can't do that right now. So there's emergency measures. The government needs to take care of all of this, needs to provide basic needs. They're talking about a thousand dollar check to every American. That's not going to do crap. We need to actually do $1,000 a month for every American. Maybe, you know, backdoor in Andrew Yang's universal basic income idea right now. We need massive support uh, financially, economically for uh, health and human services right now. Once we get through that, then there's a whole nother list of, of um, what does a more sustainable 
uh, future look like? And the answer is there. Um, you know, this well, this story. Can I interrupt for a quick oh, second? Yeah, sure. Sorry, because you're you're you know people are going two trillion dollars. Oh my God, that's a lot of money. You're saying that's not nearly enough. And I'm still back. I'm still stuck on this question of how the hell do we get here so fast? I mean, we're talking a matter of months where we had an economy with 2.5% annual growth and all this other stuff. And now we're talking about, oh my God, you know, we need the paddles because it's on life support and it could just totally die. I mean, how did this happen so quickly? And that's, that's the thing that I still puzzle about. So every single good and service that adds up to GDP requires energy. And we have to have energy materials to grow and we access credit in order to pull resources from the future to today so we can continue to consume. So not led by the United States, more led by China and the rest of the world, we've really accelerated our credit, our, our amount of credit that we create from nothing to access more resources today. So China, three months after this crisis started, is still at 60% of the thermal footprint that they were in December. So they are still, despite their uh, statistics saying that there's no more new cases of COVID, they're still on a 40% drop uh, of GDP. So the reason it happened is the same way that a shark needs oxygen uh, to live and it has to swim to get oxygen. If it stops swimming, it doesn't get oxygen in its gills. The exact same thing happened with the metabolism of the global economy. So we've stopped the hemoglobin of our, our, our networks uh, that are fueled by energy and transportation uh, nodes across the world. That's why it happened so quickly. Um, and it was all fueled by uh, excess debt since the last financial crisis. We used artificial guarantees, too big to fail rules, low interest rates, quantitative easing, all these temporary measures, many of which are still in existence from 2008 and 2009. So it happened fast because the metaphor of the shark stopped swimming. Uh, so that, that's, that's why it happened so fast. I guess it just, it, 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 to me, it just seems to highlight the brittleness of the system and the need to find another path forward. So I interrupted you when you were starting to talk about that. What would that successful? So you talked about, okay, we need to, we need to stabilize the patient right now. We need yep. to get that heartbeat uh, going and, and uh, oxygen flowing again. Once we stabilize, what, what would an, a, a better economy look like, a more successful economic recovery look like, and how do, what do we do to get there? And I think in about we, five minutes. <laughs> I think we need to um, first understand what an economy is and understand the importance of energy. This virus uh, pandemic healthcare crisis is now has two other casualties that we don't talk about. One is the climate focus and the movement around climate, because right now everyone's focused on the economy as they should be. And two, as in, or more importantly, is energy. Right now, energy is, you know, there's a price of energy, which is what we pay at the pump. There's the cost of energy, which is what the uh, energy companies need to pay. And then there's the value of energy. One barrel of oil does four and a half years of my work. We use 100 billion barrels of coal, oil, and natural gas per year, which works out to a labor force of 500 billion human workers supporting our economy. Now, a lot of that's going to be too uh, uh, cheap for the energy companies to extract. So this is really cementing an energy crisis five or 10 years down the road, because we will not invest in new upstream capacity, uh, et cetera. So what does a sustainable economy look like? We are uh, facing the end of growth, quite simply. I think we probably will recover and pierce the December 2019 global GDP numbers, but not for long. We have a few years after that before societies start to recognize we don't have the low entropy materials and energy to continue growing from a 17 terawatt metabolism global uh, entity. So all futures are going to have to use the same or less, I would argue 30 to 50% less energy. And what that means is we can no longer have GDP as our global cultural human objective. We're going to have to move away from GDP quarterly profits aggregated globally as an objective. And we're going to have to tether our goals, hopefully to some longer term sustainable ecological 
aspects will be incorporated in there. But first of all, we have to have real metrics of how people are doing. Tether our goals to well-being. And there's a lot of uh, alternative measures to GDP out there. There's uh, gross national happiness, which I'm not a fan of because evolutionary, we didn't seek happiness. We sought this cocktail of, of neurotransmitters and community and a tribal existence. And, and so I think we need massive new research on new metrics for well-being that aren't just statistics that we get from economists, but are based on surveys and interactions with people. Right now, what are people doing? They're living, they're working from home. Uh, what are the things that are working? What are the things that aren't working? We need, uh, because the, the GDP statistics that are gonna come out are gonna be horrible. Uh, we're gonna lose 50% of government tax revenue. This year, we're gonna have a you know down 30, down 20% economy. So those numbers don't mean anything anymore. We have to start looking at what is it for? What is our goal? And so I think uh, ecological and human well-being, replacing GDP with some sort of social and natural capital matrix is, is a good direction. And that's a good direction for journalists to really start diving into. And what do those stories look like? What, what, give me an idea of a story that you think they, they could... Uh uh they could look at that would be appropriate well i mean you, you need to start peeling away is all this i mean basically gdp gross domestic product is 99.5 percent correlated with energy so it more effectively would be called gdb gross domestic burning because for every product in our worlds a little fire was started somewhere on the planet to provide it but there's a lot of things before this call, he's sleeping right now, Frank, but I pay for Frank's dog food, but all the serotonin and laughter and joy I get from my dog, that's not included in GDP. You make love with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you go for a walk in the woods, all these things that are not quantified in our success of how we enjoy our lives are not remotely included. But going to Disneyland or taking a trip to Fahiti, uh, uh, you know, Fiji or Tahiti, uh, things like that, uh, boost GDP quite a bit. So we have to get away from the burning towards the well-being. Well, and it, I've always used the BP oil spill as an example of this when, when people Good talk about GDP. Uh, <laughs> I always ask, uh, say, well, was that a, a bad thing because of all the uh, damage to the fisheries and all the other things? And people go, oh, yes, that was really terrible for the economy, when in reality, it was a huge plus because of all the Tyvek suits that were sold, the, the uh, barriers to stop the oil, all the chemical dispersants, all those things are included, but that, that future damage to the environment is not. So well, even you, that you, basic uh, measure needs to change. I hope you have Herman Daly on one of your series because he talks about the goods and the bads. Um, and our current metric of GDP includes both the goods and the bads. We don't subtract out the bads. Well, in fact, uh, I was going to plug this at the end, but I'll mention that uh, Andy Rifkin, who runs the uh, sustainability and communication uh, effort at the Earth Institute, is hoping to get Herman and uh, Kate Rayworth together for a conversation sometime next week. So you want to go to that website and check for updates on that, because that would be an amazing conversation as well. All right. So um, I, I, one thing I didn't get to that, and we, we sort of tap danced around a bit is this whole energy issue. And, you know, the Green New Deal is uh, proposing, it seems like part of the, the underlying proposal is, well, we can maintain this energy intensive economy by simply shifting it to wind and solar and other things. But I, I think that's something that you would, you would heartily disagree with. Yeah, I do heartily disagree with it. I think all of the stories of renewables are assuming we just get rid of the bad fossil fuels and, and put in the good energy and then we're gonna to continue to grow. I think it's completely delusional. I think we can and should utilize our best remaining low entropy fossil resources, ancient sunlight, and combine those with our great mature, now quite cheap technology of stochastic uh, solar, wind, geothermal, some of those things to create, as John Erickson pointed out, a smaller scale economy, except the dynamic of the growth imperative requires that the conversations in academia and politics are that, oh, well, we can add solar and wind and we're going to grow. Last year, we grew the demand for electricity 
three times more than all of the solar that had ever been built since the dawn of time. So we're building this global heat engine. Corporations aren't the problem. Capitalism isn't the problem. Those are downstream of this inherent growth dynamic of humanity acting as an energy dissipating uh, super organism. And that started with agriculture and that would require quite a bit more time to explain. We need to change the incentives. We need to change the governance structure towards something that has, has boundaries, has uh, speed bumps and, and kind of firewalls uh, that give us the basic needs that we want, but within uh, limits. All right, so I think it's time to open up to questions for everyone. So John and Julie, if you want to uh, un unmute yourselves, if you could. Uh, so the first thing I want to ask is, is um, not on the list there, but the idea of there's a lot of money, although Nate, I guess you think it's not enough, but there's, there's a lot of money out there right now in the recovery package. Can some of that be used to uh, build a more progressive climate, whatever, whatever word you want to use, a more resilient um, uh, economy? Um, Nate, you want to go with that first? Or Julie? Okay, Julie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in the, in the uh, 2009 crash, the estimates were that about 52 billion was uh, put toward green uh, initiatives. I've seen more recently another estimate, which put that number at 90, which I'm not sure exactly what that was. So there's no question about that. I think some of the, the um, key things are going to be around um, health, and digital infrastructure, um, and you know, an important uh, victory that Democrats secured was not pulling out and in the uh, in the way that the um, those industries had been asking for, and it seemed pretty clear that Trump wanted to do. When when we see the actual you know details of the bill, we'll see how real that is. But that's of course been the report. I just want to say one thing, Dale, to answer. Your, your question about the speed of the shutdown, because I think it's really key. The shutdown, the, the crash of the economy was intentional. That's why it was so fast. We, we literally just shut down on a dime. And so in that sense, it's so different than, than internally generated shutdowns in which kind of um, problems in the system create a, a downturn that's, that's much less rapid. It's a little bit more like 1979 uh, when, when Paul Volcker dramatically raised interest rates to deal with inflation and the economy crashed. Of course, this is much faster, but it, it, was, it was intentional. But there were, there were problems showing up uh, even before that, that, that shutdown. Not that much. Not that, a little bit. I mean, Europe's a little weak, but no. I mean, not, no one, it, maybe we would have gone into recession in, in 2021, but it's, it's, that's not what's happening today. John? John yeah. Um, well, uh, <laughs> there's so many thoughts going through my head. Um, I mean, I would, I would pick up on the theme that one, one of the questions earlier that you posed is examples of doing it right. Um, um, you know, there, there have been a number of initiatives for a number of years on what Nate was talking about, of shifting to different metrics, shifting to more well-being, um, in ourselves from the need to constantly grow and have growth both be the solution and cause to all of our problems. Um, I, I'm, incur I, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Iceland and um, I've been teaching there since 2008. In fact, the very first time I taught there was the week of the the last big crash, which hit Iceland really hard. Um, and they were one of the hardest hit countries in the world, yet they recovered the fastest and quickest. Um, they really leaned into um, social capital. Uh, they leaned into a, a different kind of story, uh, more cooperative collective action. Um, they are an economy that, you know, most people my age grew up on farms and are now working in the city, but are more connected with a very, very different story, a very, very different past. And the, the challenge in the US is that we've lost that sense of well-being and togetherness and that sense of, you know, we're all in this together. 
this kind of poison of this highly individualistic economics that is being taught and preached to our young people, um, I hope changes out of, out of this and we move towards a well-being economy, we move towards collective action. Um, we stop labeling everything as socialism as if it's like some big evil boogeyman from communist era Russia. Um, Americans need to wake up that the rest of the world um, is, has been and is doing things in a different way. Well, and it's it's interesting. I, I, I we've all seen the, the the change that that's happened. I got a call this morning from a friend who wants to uh, have a, uh, a virtual dinner where uh, he and his wife sit at a table and have dinner, and uh, my wife and I have dinner, and we can talk to each other on the computer. But but even more human connection. You know, I see I live in a neighborhood of about a hundred houses, and it's amazing how many people are out walking now who never walked before. And there's, there's physical distance uh, and there's caution and you wave at each other from the other side of the street. But uh, it, this seems to be bringing out some of the best in us in, in ways of trying to maintain these connections. There's a, a really interesting um, framing issue here because they talk about social, uh, social distance and social isolation. And I would uh, say that all the reporters that you start changing that language and make it physical distance because we need social connections. If we go into social isolation, then that leads to a lot of mental health issues and other problems. We need to be talking about physical distance, not social distance. But I'm curious whether that will, if people have suddenly seen, wow, you know, these are the things that are really important and that will carry through as uh, the economy recovers or not. Um, so just, just uh, some musing, but let me uh, uh, go some of the questions um, and see if we can start answering some of those quickly. The Green New Deal is a federal approach. Can it be scaled to state and local actions and, as well? And if so, what does that look like? John, you wanna start with that? Yeah, I'd love to because we've been, been giving this a lot of thought and working with uh, our students here at the University of Vermont. Um, in fact, uh, David Zuckerman, our Lieutenant Governor is, is on right now on Facebook Live and he's been one of the leaders of what has been called a Green Mountain New Deal for Vermont. Um, yeah, we don't have to wait for some magical Green New Deal to appear in Washington, D.C. and kind of cross our fingers that the right set of circumstances in both the Congress and the executive branch happen. States are taking up this conversation. Regions are taking up this conversation. Cities are taking up this conversation. Um, this is a movement. Um, it, and it's, it's a movement that, yes, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has helped to kind of put on the national map, but it's, it's a movement that um, is, is galvanizing support from all over the country. Um, and, and again, it's about more than just transforming our energy sector. That gets all the press and the Green New Deal. But if you look at, for example, the 14 mobilization strategies, the clean energy strategy is just one. Uh, it's about resilience in our communities. It's about our food and our water and our waste management systems. It's about investing in the training of a new workforce so that we're not leaving people behind. Um, you know, all the promises of saving coal jobs in Kentucky and West Virginia is not happening. <laughs> uh, Kentucky is hemorrhaging coal jobs. Um, and, and because they're hemorrhaging coal jobs in kind of a market context, they're left to their own bottoms, to their own devices. Green New Deal is about uh, making the investments in the radical, fast, rapid transformation. And that ultimately will happen at state and local levels. Yep, hang on, Nate. I Could I just say one, yeah. add, one thing to, add one thing to that, which is that um, I, am, I work with the uh, 350 uh, Massachusetts group and we have begun, and probably John, you're involved in this, but conversations with people active in uh, all the other New England states for a kind of regional push. So it's both uh, things happening at the state level, which are certainly going on all around the country and the local. And then I think we also need that regional cooperation uh, in particular on some issues like transportation um, where we've got regional systems. So um, there's a lot there's a lot that's happening. There's a lot happening in Massachusetts um, and many other states, uh, New York, California, et cetera, on a, on a state level Green New Deal. Yeah, one of the first casualties of this, of the meeting cancellations was a big meeting about a New England Green New Deal that right. was gonna happen in New Hampshire. 
So yeah. um, it's 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 moving and shaking. People aren't going to wait for the the federal government to swoop in. Well, I'll ask the three of you to give me some examples of specific local communities where some of these things are happening right now that we can put up on the website. Nate, it looks like the the puppy had a response to this. Yeah, he got bored. Uh, <laughs> just to build on a really important point that John just made. Um, we are not alive in normal times. We can't go back to the thinking that we had even last Christmas. And John points out about the federal versus the local. We can't just sit in our local communities and wait for the feds to bail us out. So people have means, the haves in our communities, those that have amassed some digital electronic surplus can spend that in their communities on hoop houses, on protecting uh, ecological restoration, on getting land for young people to grow food on locally, to, to build social capital. People in communities need to take ownership of this and maybe you get a, a, a apolitical combination of some climate activists, some farmers, some Republicans, some retired people, some school children, all working together on collaborative projects to fix potholes or paint your school or things that we do together because we are not going to navigate this crisis unless the left and the right and all different flavors of our constituency of the United States citizenry work together because that's the situation we're in. If we do this in a partisan way, we are really in deep doo-doo. All right, we've got a question that goes to basically the fundamental nature of what we're talking about to some extent. Isn't the bouncing back resilience model outdated, giving multidimensional changes that are underway. I'll just have a quick comment to that. I don't think resilience is what we're looking at right now. Um, uh, Nassim Taleb uh, coined the word uh, anti-fragile, which is when some exogenous force hits you, you don't bounce back to normal. You actually get stronger and go in a different direction. And I think that's the sort of story we need. John, Julie? Okay. Um, how did, let's see, did we, uh, did not do this. Uh, should ecosystem services uh, be added to nation's GDP so that economies place appropriate value on healthy ecosystems? This is what we talked about, uh, Nate, with the, the BP oil spill and how these ecosystem services. So a quick definition of ecosystem services and should these be added in? Well, I, I can jump in here. I mean, this is a this is a challenging question, actually, because it's it's become a hallmark of my field of ecological economics to recognize that ecosystems have functions, and those functions have values to humans, and then there's been a lot of push to put those values kind of inside the current economic system, right? By by putting dollar values on things that you know many of which are ultimately priceless and don't have clear substitutes, um, so. It, it's it's been used as a strategy to kind of wake up the status quo, you know, to say that the economy has costs and benefits and we're only counting everything as a benefit, nothing as a cost. So the depletion of our ecosystems should be seen as a cost, not as a fire sale and a good thing. Um, my own work on the genuine progress indicator, for example, we got passed into law here in Vermont, um, a new indicator that is meant to measure the broader um, contribution of the economy to our well-being, and uh, to make sure that we're not that we're truly in still in economic growth, and not Herman Dale's growth, right? Where we're growing and only counting the benefits and not the cost, but we're actually each new unit of growth costs more than it gives back. Um, so, the question of ecosystem services is an important one. Um, it's foundational to the health and well-being of our societies. It's, um, we got to stop, and the re reporters on the call need to help us. We got to stop sort of framing this as either or, right? Either we get jobs, either we can have a strong economy, or we can have a healthy environment. Um, it's got to be both. Um, and the new economy, the new kinds of jobs, the new kinds of the uh, right-sized economy will help us do that. I highly recommend George Lakoff's book, Don't Think of an Elephant, and uh, his work about the, the world of framing. And this is something that I have the fellows always read. And perhaps this is a conversation we need to have in the next few weeks 
if we can get Lakoff to talk about framing of issues that might be good for journalists, because that is a significant, significant point. One of the questions comes to uh, it reflects it what. Oh, I'm know. sorry. Yeah, I just want to say one thing on this, and it connects with the framing. I mean, I've never been a fan of the the uh, price ecosystem services. Uh, approach precisely because it basically throws in the towel on being able to kind of reorient to an economy to a different set of values and says, well, since the only thing we care about is what, you know, has dollar, dollar terms associated with it, we'll go in that way. If we think about uh, societies which have had sustainable relationships with the, the uh, ecosystems, human societies with the ecosystems, they, uh, they are nested within, um, thinking, for example, of, of Ostrom's work, uh, none of those societies put, put dollar values on their ecosystems. They, were, they figured out ways of protecting ecosystems and using them sustainably uh, without doing that. So I think we can do that also. It does mean that we need these sort of, you know, multi-indicator, uh, uh, um, multiple variable indicators for making decisions, the kinds that John and, and Nate have been talking about. Yeah, they, yeah, sorry, I'd love to jump in real quick because I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this pricing of the prices is a slippery slope. It's like Julie says, it's throwing in the towel. You know, I, I remind my students that, you know, go back and look at the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. There was no economic test, right? It was like, based on the best available science, we will set standards that uh, promote human health. Uh, we will set standards that reduce the risk of extinction. Um, now, granted, these laws have been hung up for years because they've tried to introduce economic tests um, through the 80s and 90s, but we have to resist the economization, the economism of everything, right? Where all social values are reduced to money. That's really dangerous. And I hope that coming out of this crisis, people will realize that um, uh, that all, how do you frame it, Nate? The good things in life are free, right? Or something like that. Hang on, Nate. I got gotcha. you. You're muted, Nate. Yeah, go oh. ahead. Yeah, go well, ahead. naturally, my PhD advisor would say something that I totally agree with, of course. Um, but uh, yes, the problem here, I completely agree with Julie and John. What has happened is we've financialized the human experience. So in our ancestral environment, we had this core group of 100, 150 humans that were collaborating and singing and hunting and, and telling stories and singing and all these experiences. But now we, we've parsed everything into one unit, the dollar, which means that we aggregate surplus, which we, all this energy money stuff, instead of the, the rich contextualization of all the other things, Therefore, I, I'm not a fan of, of the ecosystem service uh, uh, parsing into one denomination, but I think this is something journalists could really dive into is how do we move beyond the parsing of all of our experiences into one unit? And as John was about to say, the best things in life are free once our basic needs are covered. And for half of our country, that asterisk of our basic needs are covered is no longer true. So we have to address that simultaneously. All right, there's a, a question that, that relates to what's been happening uh, 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 quite a lot all of a sudden. And when we talk about uncovered stories, I think this is one that journalists can, can consider looking at. And that is uh, we're already seeing governments around the world use this, uh, this situation as an opportunity to uh, ease environmental rules to help industry right now. So how do, the question is, how do we ensure the environment isn't sidelined as we try to help the economy, which is uh, what's actually happening right now. And we're not seeing a lot of coverage of that. Anybody want to address, speak to that? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, again, this is, this is about, you have to keep, keep things moving on the economic transformation. Um, you also have to recognize that um, these kinds of pandemics are coming uh, fast and furious more often because we've uh, degraded the environment. Um, there's a connection here, right? So as we've expanded our economy, as we've um, made water more and more scarce, 
people, livestock, and wildlife are sharing dwindling water sources. So boom, emergence of zoonotic disease that can jump between species. As the climate changes, um, this is changing all kinds of disease vectors, uh, especially disease vectors that thrive in warmer, wetter conditions. Um, as we expand the economic system into um, uh, and, and degrade our ecological systems, we're putting humans in contact with disease vectors that uh, we never have before. So, um, and, and it's also important to say that the Western world is kind of waking up to these health crises where much of the world is in a health crisis day to day to day um, from things like malaria and dengue and um, diarrheal disease. Um, this is the kind of normal state of affairs for most of the world's population. Unfortunately, this, this coronavirus will first and foremost harm them the most again. Uh, Julia, a question uh, specifically to you, and I, I, this is, uh, uh, really gets at the idea of, of framing stories and finding something original or more engaging from something. So the question is that they've seen a lot of feel-good innovation stories about 3D printing and med equipment exchanges. How would you reframe these to make them about alternative economic models? Well, I think to the extent, I mean, obviously you're gonna need the hook of the COVID-19 for the stories now, but I think that to the extent that the stories can um, highlight number one, the sort of past history of these, that this is not something that just got developed. Number two, um, some of the analytical thinking uh, that's been done around this um, and the networks that exist. So for example, when I wrote Plenitude 10 years ago, there was already a global movement for 3D printing. Um, you know, people were printing uh, artificial limbs in Afghanistan, um, doing a 3D and so forth. So kind of the backstory of this as a viable uh, manufacturing uh, sector, um, the kinds of things that are being 3D printed. One thing about 3D so printing- So you, 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 you mean a small scale effort. So that's the alternative part is that we don't need a huge factory to do these things now. You can have a 3D printer get the plans and, and print one-off or small volumes for a small community in rural Africa that might need something. Right. But that this is sort of, this is a technology that's now been around for a while. It's been tested and it, it gives us the possibility of a different kind of manufacturing system in which much more of what we do is distributed rather than this highly centralized, globalized manufacturing system that is proving to be so brittle in, uh, in, in the current pandemic. So I, I probably won't have another chance to say anything. And there was one more thing that I wanted to, if that's okay, to get out there in terms of both story and also economy going forward. It connects to the issue of scale and that is time use and working hours. And we will not have a sustainable or resilient or whatever term you wanna use, eco ecologically viable economy if we, if we continue to produce at the scale that we are doing. And there's no way to really reduce scale, I don't think, in wealthy countries without reducing working hours. And the current moment gives us a great opportunity for telling new stories about people who are working fewer hours per day, producing less. It goes to Nate's point about, you know, the things that matter and, for, and give us uh, well-being and so forth, and really asking that question about the work and spend society. And that, to me, that's like a, a great storyline because we're almost all work, I mean, maybe not the journalists, but, you know, most people are working less, earning less. And let's also look at the ways daily life is changing for people in, in some ways that, you know, we could think about going forward with that smaller economy. So let's, uh, we're, we're near the end here. Why don't we come up, uh, if you could, um, I'm trying to think of resources that, that the journalists can walk away with as well. Are there, uh, can you name two organizations that they should be looking at that might have story ideas? Nate, for instance, the Post Carbon Institute uh, is doing some good work and has some interesting stuff on the Resilience website about things that are happening, alternative uh, economic focuses, other things. But uh, can you come up with one or two places that you would say journalists should look at as a 
as a source for potential story ideas, sure. uh, organizations that are doing interesting work, anything that you can think of in that regard. John? I'll, I'll jump in with one before Julie uses it. <laughs> That's the Next System Project. Um, they're, they've been doing for a number of years, it's a project of the Democracy Collaborative, uh, co-chaired by uh, Gus Speth and Gar Aporvitz. They've been kind of collecting the, the local stories, the regional stories, cataloging the stories of people doing things in a different way and asking the question, how can we either scale up or scale out these, these cre creative ways of designing the next system? So check out the next system project, a really, really cool place for, for stories. Yeah, Thanks, I sent that link. To Dale and the, the another kind of related one is called and I also sent this link new economy coalition, which is a, a, a coalition of, of all member groups all over the country of people who are kind of doing new economics and they've got a lot of stuff current stuff on what's happening right now with the response to the pandemic, but also, you know, a lot of backstory there too. Nate, uh, am, am I on? You are. I think that's the second step. There's a more important first step, Dale, which is we need journalists to start to play the role of system synthesis. This entire story fits together. Human behavior, energy, ecology, money, debt, finance, the economy, uh, community, it all fits together. The human brain can understand and imagine millions of more possibilities than exist in the in the physical world. So we hear these nice stories in the media and people are like, oh yeah, that sounds great. Let's just get rid of all the fossil carbon and replace it with renewables and live just like we, we do now. We live in a world where we have islands of expertise separated by oceans of nonsense. We have a renewable energy expert. We have a climate expert. We have a psychologist. They don't talk to each other. So in the journalistic perspective, instead of having 10 journalists around a table, one's a climate person, one's an energy person, one's a social justice person, you need each of those 10 to become educated in the system that we are all part of. And then you can start making cohesive, coherent recommendations, questions, et cetera. We've arrived at a species level conversation. We have to look at how things fit together. All right. That sounds like that's a John. You had one last thing. I, I just, oh man, that's fantastic. I'd love to add to that. I wrote this down too, because uh, the media, much like academia, uh, tends to ignore what is sort of deemed as impossible. Um, but I'm reminded uh, from the Nelson Mandela quote that quote, it always seems impossible until it's done. That's the attitude we need. Julie, do you want a final word? No. Thanks. All right. Thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, I want to thank you for the, this wonderful discussion. And there's a lot more uh, left on the table here, but uh, I think we need to let everybody get back to work. Before you leave, uh, those who are watching some additional information, please note that we will have a blog post that will contain additional information and resources on this topic. I hope to get it up this weekend. And it'll be found at the homepage for Andy Revkin's initiative on communication and sustainability. And that's where my project will be living. That address is sustcom. So that's S-U-S-T-C-O-M-M dot E-I dot Columbia dot E-D-U. So sustcom dot E-I dot Columbia dot E-D-U. While there, do look for information on a chat that Andy hopes to pull together with Herman Daly and Kate Rayworth that should be coming up in the week or, next week or so. And I think that will be an incredible uh, conversation as well. This is the first of many conversations we hope to have uh, over the coming months that uh, are aimed at journalists. Uh, also, speaking of resources, our friends at Island Press, before I forget this, are offering a great set of free ebooks on their website. And that link is islandpress.org forward slash free dash e dash books our thanks to juliet nate and john for joining us and again to uh, john for allowing us to stream on his facebook site from the earth institute i wish you a safe and productive weekend and remember it's not social distancing it's physical distancing keep those social connections open thanks everybody and have a wonderful weekend